Hey everyone, it is August 15, 2013. I am Rene Ritchie, and right now, today, we are going to be talking all about Apple's September 10th event, the iPhone 5S, maybe the iPhone 5C, iOS 7, and so much more. This is the iMore Show. Joining me as always is the managing editor of iMore.com and the executive editor of The Loop, Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? Good. How are you, Renee? I'm doing very well, thank you. And I have a special treat for everybody because also joining us is the senior editor of um, iMore and editor at large for Mobile Nations because once in a while he dips his finger into every mobile platform in the UK, Mitch, Mr. Richard Devine. How are you, Richard? I'm very well, Renee. How are you? I wasn't sure whether to do that or to do some say <laughs> he also knows Android. We just call him the Stig. <laughs> I try. I try. You're not denying it, though. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> it's in the terms of the contract. I'll have to ask you something embarrassing about Jeremy Clarkson at uh, some point, and then we can find out. So since we last got together... A word broke, uh, the Wall Street Journal got it first this year, Ina Freed, that Apple would be holding their traditional September event, which is now their iPhone event, on September 10th. I was able to confirm that with our sources a couple hours later, and then on Monday after his heavy metal concert ended, Jim Dalrymple decided to yep it for the benefit of humanity. Uh, Peter, Apple's been doing this event for going on a decade now, it's, and yet it still seems every year like it's a big surprise to everybody. Yeah, and it really shouldn't be. You know, I mean, we have we just, you know, some basic arithmetic tells you that something was going to happen in the early fall um, as far as you know iOS announcements were concerned. So, really shouldn't be a big surprise to us. But you know, for whatever reason, people are thrilled to hear it anyway. And I mean, you know, the interesting thing is that this hasn't actually been confirmed by Apple, uh, but you know, the fact that. Our sources have confirmed it. The fact that Jim Dalrymple has yepped it, the fact that Ina felt comfortable enough goes uh, to, to go with it, tells you that it's pretty incontrovertible. Yeah, it seems like Apple never. Apple doesn't confirm these things ever. They will no comment this until the cows come home, and then they will send out an invitation to the press roughly seven days before the event, just for all the really good air flight deals to run out first. Yeah, exactly. I think Air, I think Apple really wants to stick it to the traveling press who doesn't uh, live in the Bay Area. Uh, so, Richard, what we've heard so far is that it's definitely going to be an iPhone 5S, whether or not it's called that. You know, that's typically what we consider the next generation product that looks like the last generation product. Yeah, I mean, it's it's what we're all expecting. Um... And of course, you know, it's consistent with uh, with the sort of leaks and things that we've seen so far. Um, you know, we're we're basically expecting it to look pretty much the same as the current iPhone. Um, there's talk of a slightly different, uh, slightly different dual LED flash on the back. But you know, for all intents and purposes, if you sit, you know, we're we're expecting something to sit next to an iPhone 5 and look pretty much, uh, pretty much identical. Now, I um, heard that there might be a I've heard there might be a problem with this, but I'm interested in your opinion because, you know, you just finished trying out the Lumia 925. You're, you're familiar with BlackBerry. You've written for Android Central. I did an article several months ago about whether there's an iPhone 5S problem, whether, you know, when, when Samsung's putting out the Galaxy S4, HTC's doing the HTC One, Nokia's doing the 9, sorry, the 1020. Can Apple still afford this every second generation TikTok cycle? It's, I mean, it's a tough one. It's... I sort of think back to the uh, to when Samsung announced the the Galaxy S4 and it looked pretty much identical to the Galaxy S3, but just you know a little bit bigger, a little bit slimmer. But you know the whole the overall footprint was more or less the same. And you know the jokes started flying that well, how am I, you know how how are people going to know I've got the new one? Um, we're, you know we're kind of used to it with uh, with Apple, obviously the 3GS and you know the 4S. It, I, I'm not so sure that people are as concerned um, they usually sort of you know they usually pull something out of the bag to you know to make people want to you know you know want to upgrade but I mean I don't really see any you know any reason for them to pander to the crowd and and just do something radically different you know and deviate from from proven track record when you know it, it would just be for the sake of doing it I think you know everybody else does it why shouldn't Apple do it but you know they, I, I just don't think they will 
See, Peter, you know the old charge, right? And, and people say that about the iPhone 5. It was basically our, our favorite dark willow line, bored now. <laughs> and the iPhone 3GS, I mean, that had voice and that had speed and that had video recording. The iPhone 4S had Siri and, you know, better video recording. The iPhone 5S, rumored to have a more advanced, not necessarily faster, but more advanced processor, probably a better camera. The rumor is f2.0, you know, a much better aperture on the camera, and maybe a fingerprint scanner. Is that enough to excite people who might already have a 5? I don't know that it'll excite people that already have a 5, but it should certainly excite the millions of people who are still using 4s and 4s. I mean, let's face it, Apple's got a couple of different issues that, they're, that, that they can... Um, uh, start to put to bed with a 5S. Uh, and one of them is that they've got uh, literally hundreds of millions of devices out there that still use the old 30-pin dock connector. And, um, uh, you know, many iPhones that are in the 4 form factor, if you will. Um, the uh, A 5S would enable them to get uh, more machines uh, or more phones into the market that use the new form factor of the 5 um, and also uh, use the new lightning connector. So I, I think that Apple has some compelling reasons to keep things the same with the 5S in terms of the overall size and form factor of the device, um, regardless of what kind of features they add to it. Certainly there's going to be some stuff. I mean, it's been a year since we've seen an iPhone, and Apple hasn't been sitting on its thumbs that entire time. It's been innovating. Um, but just this afternoon we had a post uh, from uh, from Allie mm -hmm. uh, talking uh, with some spy shots of, of what she suspects are new components um, in, in the 5S, and it looks like Apple's got something up its sleeve. It's just we're not really clear on what yet. Yeah, the big rumor is a fingerprint scanner, which, based on their uh, authentic purchase, the home button is the most commonly rumored thing. You basically swipe your thumb there and either use that instead of a PIN code or in addition to your PIN code to sort of verify who you are. And for people who hate the PIN code, it would be a faster way of gaining entry to your device because, you know, God knows those face recognition things don't work. And for people who want more security, it would be what I think you spoke about last week, Peter, right, which is something you know and something that you are. Right, exactly. Again, I don't necessarily think that it's a really co it's going to be a really compelling reason for anybody but the the most ardent iPhone lovers to upgrade from an iPhone 5, but it'll certainly give a lot of people with older phones pause to say, "Hey, wait a minute. This is a good thing. We might as well jump now." You know, I can just see Richard, I can see the uh, Christmas commercial already. Evil elf or or Mr. or Scrooge or whomever steals Santa's iPhone, tries to switch the naughty and nice list, can't get past the thumb scanner. Santa shows up, swipes his thumb, gets the list, saves Christmas. Apple logo the end. It's all you know, it's, it, it writes itself, doesn't it? It's it's poetic. I mean, I, I'm not sure, like you know, a fingerprint scanner would be something I'd particularly you know be be that excited about but it is an interesting uh, it is an interesting idea I and mean, uh, Motorola tried it a couple of years ago with the with the Atrix and it was just horrible it was a separate strip on the phone you know it, it was it was some, it looked as if it was tagged on it was an extra it was a, a spec you know in the never ending spec race of uh, of android devices um, for apple to, to you know if if indeed they are going to do it and you know to to seamlessly put it underneath the home button so it's just you know, you're just doing what you always do. You just press the home button. You, you know, you're and you're into your phone. It's it's a it's an interesting idea. Um, some people are still going to see it as a gimmick, whichever way you look at it. I think it's you, you know, there's always going to be that um, that kind of reaction to it. But it, it all depends on how well it works. I mean, you mentioned the um, the facial recognition things uh, that, that that Google introduced, and it's it, it kind of works, but it's generally pretty horrible. I could put a photo of Phil Nickinson on my face and get into any of his devices. Yeah, it, it's it, you know it, it does it does what they say it does, but it's not necessarily very secure. Obviously, you know a fingerprint scanner is much it, you know is is much more uh, much more secure on that front. But I mean, whether or not it's something that's going to make people say, oh yeah, you know I want I want the five S over sticking with the five. You know who knows, but um, it, it's it, it'll be interesting to see how it all uh, how it all pans out for sure. 
The other interesting thing in the rumor, and we don't know if this is going to be announced at the same event or not, is an iPhone 5C, and that's the rumored name for the less expensive iPhone. Not cheap, because you know Apple doesn't do cheap. They do uh, Mac Mini and iPad Mini and you know products of that ilk. IPad, iPod Mini becomes Nano. But the iPhone 5C would help Apple increase their addressable market. when Originally, when they were planning this, and I've heard they've been working on this since 2009, 2010, they decided to keep last year's model and reduce the price, and that was a great way to get people who buy on contract to get an iPhone um, cheaper. But there are also people who buy off contract. There's whole markets, like Asian markets, uh, places around the world where buying off contract is the norm. There's also people in the U.S. who've been buying iPhone 4s at, at a much higher level, and that's been putting downward price pressure on all the iPhones. And, you know, to Peter's point earlier, an iPhone 4S going to free, that still has a dock connector, still has a four and a half inch screen. So, Peter, I think the iPhone 5C, if it becomes real, is a sign that Apple believes that they can, A, make a great, low, less expensive product finally, which they might not be able to do years ago, but also increase their addressable market by hitting a totally different demographic, those next one billion people for whom price really is one of the most important features. Absolutely. And, I mean, even in the U.S., there's an increasing number of, of people who are off contract contract. Um, you know, it, it, admittedly, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of American customers who are using iPhones are still doing it uh, the old-fashioned way on Sprint, on AT&T, on Verizon, where they're paying um, uh, maybe a monthly uh, uh, fee for their phone, but it's 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 a part of a subsidy that's built into their, their plan, and they're on some kind of two-year contract. Uh, with their service provider. But T-Mobile has really kind of broken the mold with their whole uncarrier program. That's how I'm using my iPhone 5 now, which is unsubsidized. Um, and I really prefer it because uh, you save a lot, of, a lot of money over the long term uh, than you do with that sort of contract. So recognizing that and recognizing that a very good deal um, of the potential smartphone market outside of the United States um, does not rely on subsidies in order to uh, to be able to afford smartphones. The 5C looks like a really um, good device for Apple to, to help Apple uh, uh, grow its market share a little bit. Um, the concern that I've got is whether or not the iPhone 5C is going to diminish the iPhone experience at all. If it's going to be a lesser phone, um, you know, I can deal with some restrictions, like maybe less memory than you're used to, or um, a slightly slower processor. But if if it's a substantially different experience than uh, the iPhone 5 or the iPhone 5s, you know, that that's that's dangerous territory. But I have faith that whatever Apple's got up its sleeve, it's going to be a nice product. Yeah, I don't think they've ever artificial. I mean, the Mac Mini they just cut off. Uh, the display and they didn't make it uh, user expandable the way the Mac Pro was. The iPod Nano and Mini, um, they just they they just weren't as big as the classic iPod and the shuffle got rid of the screen. The iPad the iPad Mini, you know, it, it had a slower processor, it wasn't retina, so they made compromises. But to your point, it never compromised those core values of either OS ten or iOS. That's exactly right. You know, some people really cautioned me yesterday when I used this analogy, but I, I said to people who think that the iPhone 5C is going to devalue uh, the Mac experience, just remember the LC when it came out in 1990. Now, admittedly, Apple by the mid-90s was a company that was in a lot of trouble, but if you were around uh, the, the, the Apple ecosystem, um, in 1990, you might remember that the LC was a really big deal because Apple had built progressively more and more expensive Macs. And then all of a sudden they offered this the, the first low-cost Macs and Mac in this little pizza box um, unit and it sold like hotcakes and it spurred Apple to do some other really cool things like resurrect the classic um, and some other stuff at the time. So if the 5C has the same effect on uh, the smartphone market, I think it would be a really smart move for Apple. And one of the things, I mean, you wrote about this today, Richard, is that China Mobile still hasn't come to a deal with Apple, and they're the biggest carrier in the world. And other people have been saying that Android's real growth isn't in high-end phones like the Galaxy S4 or the HTC One, but in those low-cost phones, because people, every, every nerd who wanted a smartphone has one, and now it's the normal people who are buying smartphones, and they're much more price conscious, and they're not even using these phones like phones. They're using them as Facebook devices or texting devices, and that's the market, you know, the market that Android is dominating that maybe Apple has to take a bite out of next. Yeah, definitely. I mean, China's a, China's a fantastic example because um, 
that you know like say china mobile's the world's largest carrier but it doesn't have an iphone um you know that's in part due to their somewhat questionable technology you know the their 3g is is pretty poor and but they are a, a carrier for the masses um and you know in, in china the likes of huawei lenovo they're doing really really well but they're also able to make these mass market devices to a budget but people still want the iphone there you know it, Apple's seen a little bit of a drop in uh, in iPhone sales, but I mean China Mobile would be a huge deal if they could get the you know if they could get the five C made to a like say not cheap but a you know a good price point and a, a good attractive price point and get it out there and you know if Tim Cook can come on stage on September ten and say we've partnered with the world's largest carrier by the way here's the five C you've got a you've you know it's marketing gold you've got a you know you've got a double whammy just uh, just there. Today, Apple invents colored plastic phones. Absolutely, and they, they, you know, they've done plastic, you know, plastic hardware before. People kind of think plastic and, and think cheap, especially with some of the competing, uh, competing Android phones. But, you know, I mean, I, I remember that my first Mac was a, a, an 11-inch iBook, and that was plastic, but it didn't feel cheap. You iPhone know, was, 3G, 3GS. Yeah, they, they're all good, you know, they're all good quality hardware devices. You know, Apple makes plastic stuff but they do it right they don't just you know they, they don't skimp on what they're actually putting into the hardware it's it's not worse than my 1980s Hasbro G.I. Joe and Transformer <laughs> toys a little before my time that one <laughs> Peter knows what I'm talking about exactly yes yeah. um, so one of the other things that people have been talking about is the idea of a larger sized um, iPhone and I think that there's a big misconception because a lot of geeks say that the big phones are winning Apple has to make a big phone and that might be true outside the US but inside the US people are still buying more iPhones than any other phone combined and that's true in AT&T and Verizon that's absolutely true in Apple stores uh, and that and all those other phones aren't large screen phones either that's a mix of lower cost small screen phones and large screen, you know, high-end uh, Android and Windows Phone and BlackBerry devices, which means that people are choosing the four-inch or below size by vast majority over the large screen size. But that's not what we're seeing internationally. And more importantly, and I think we can make a parallel between uh, AT&T exclusivity and four-inch exclusivity, it's another potential addressable market for Apple. And what makes me curious, Peter, is that you know we have two sizes of iPads, two sizes of iMacs, two sizes of MacBook Airs, two sizes of MacBook Pros. It seems like Apple eventually either grows or reduces down to having two screen sizes for everything. And I think maybe not this year, but eventually it makes sense to have two screen sizes for iPhone. Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, eventually it will. But right now, no, it really doesn't. For the reasons that I talked about before with the 5S, you know, I think that the one of the advantages that the 5C is going to have is it's going to be a lightning connector. It's going to be more or less the same size, the same dimensions as the 5. Um, so Apple is, is trying to, to get that uniform form factor and that connector. Uh, used more consistently, um, you know. I have, and I mean, Richard can attest to this even more than I can because um, he he has experience using Android models that are, you know, these surfboards. Um, it, it's not a great user experience compared to a nice, uh, easily pocketable um, uh, phone like the iPhone 5 that still is the width of your thumb, so you can more easily navigate it using one hand. Um, you know, with the width of the radius of your thumb, I should say. Uh, some of these really big phones, uh, you know, may have nice big screens, but um, uh, the, what I'm hearing from, you know, people on Twitter and the tech press and some of the pundits who are saying that Apple uh, needs to have a bigger phone smacks more penis envy to, to me than it does really a legitimate need for a larger device. So Richard Way, and you've used all these larger devices. I think for some people they are comp like I understand Peter's argument. I think there are people who want bigger tech size, which iOS 7 will fix. There's people who want more screen real estate, though, or there's people who simply like you know Callie Lewis and and John P. They don't want to carry a tablet, so they'd rather have a phone that was closer to a tablet. Yeah, I mean you're right. There are there are those you know there are the, the niche markets of people who just want something that size. But um, I mean, I've just I've just been using a, a Lumia 925 for a couple of weeks, and it's not, you know, it's not Android massive, but it's still, you know, it's still substantially taller and wider than the iPhone 5. And you know, I have small hands, 
So using a you know the 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 one-handed thing that Apple always sort of say you know you can use the phone fully one-handed, people make fun of it, but it's true. And for some of us, it's really you know it's really key to our experience. I mean, if you want a, a gigantic phone, Samsung's got you covered. Things like the Galaxy Note, you know, they're 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 a, they're a tailored experience to that gigantic screen. You've got the pen, you've got this you know the screen real estate to do something with it. But some of the phones that are coming out today, to me, just feel like they're making something with a huge, gigantic screen because it's another spec that looks good on a, you know, on a, on a piece of paper. And uh, it, it's like, like Peter says, you know, it, the the experience is compromised uh, too much in some regards. And Apple, as we, you know, as we well know, they don't generally like compromising on user experience. So let's say, just idle speculation to wrap up this part of the show, um, let's say Apple makes an iPhone 5S this year and introduces an iPhone 5C, and then they decide that there is value in offering two screen sizes of iPhone, and maybe it's not 5 inches, maybe it's a more reasonable 4.3 or 4.5. Do they then go to three models? Is there an iPhone 6 that's the same size, an iPhone 6X that's bigger, and an iPhone 6C that's cheaper? Or does the high-end model go a little bit bigger, so the 6 is a bigger phone, and then the 6C is the same 4-inch uh, size that we have now, Peter? Do you think Apple could go to 3 models? Do you think they're best served by staying at 2? Well, Apple's been very well served by 2 for the, the past few years, but that doesn't mean they can't mix things up. Um, I, I, I Honestly, Renee, I don't have a sense one way or the other as to how they would do it, whether they would go with... Um, you know, three models or just, you know, continue with the two model spectrum that they do now, but, um, uh, you know, hop up to a different form factor when, when next year rolls around. One thing I know for sure is that it seems like every time Apple switches up the, the, the product line with a new form factor, they do run into some manufacturing hiccups. Uh, you know, the fabricators have trouble getting the iPhone 5s together. Uh, you know, look at all the trouble that they had with IMAX last last, uh, yeah. last Christmas season. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are some bugs to be worked out in their, um, uh, in their supply chain for sure. But um, I can't imagine that Apple would sacrifice um, the, the usability of a smaller phone exclusively just to have a larger phone. So I think if they did it, it would be an option. You know, it's funny, as I've, as I've said a number of times in these podcasts, I work on the weekends at an Apple specialist, and it's funny how many people come up to me about the and ask me questions about the iPad mini and want to know if it can make phone calls. Yeah. You know, it, it, it sounds weird for anybody who's actually used an iPad mini or is just familiar with the iPad, but people do think of this thing as something phablet-sized. You know, and, and they want to make calls. So I don't know. Maybe that's another direction that Apple could go in. FaceTime audio, have... Peter. FaceTime audio, right? Yeah. You know, the the maybe that's another direction that they could go in. They could ju they could just you know build some kind of voice capabilities into the iPad Mini instead. Kill two yeah. birds with one stone. I think it was. Be I think it was. I forget which show it was. It might have been Macworld last year, where I had uh, my phone died and I ended up being stuck at uh, Toronto Airport for nine hours, and all I had was an iPad Mini, and I ended up using it as everything. I, I had Skype on it; it was a phone. I was walking around with it clutched in a claw hand, uh, and it was big, but it got everything done that I needed it to do. Um, Richard, you've seen Samsung put out every screen size at a quarter inch intervals. Mm -hmm. Is there a you know Apple did take the iPod range through a you know four or five different products? Where do you think they should ultimately go with the iPhone? Personally, I think the the sweet I mean the sweet spot for me is about four point three inches. Um, you know, it's it's big enough to be noticeably bigger than the the current screen, but it's not that big that you know things start getting tough to use one handed. I think for me, I think that's the key. You know, they've, Apple's built this, even with the with the iPad Mini. You know, they say that you can you can you can comfortably hold it in one hand, and one handed is kind of, it's a big you know it's a big deal. If you're you know if you're like when you were rushing through the airport, you know you're having to use the iPad Mini with two hands, obviously. But you know if you're just wanting to you know call somebody, reply to a text or an email, you're not going to have two hands free. Um, and you know for for me, four point three is generally about as big as you know, you can you can go there with uh, without without going into the uh, you know without having really big hands. But I mean, just going back to the um, to the tablet as well. Uh, I've actually recently uh, recently reviewed the Asus phone pad, um, and there's there's a haunting image that will you know that will follow me around everywhere I go. You know, they've put a 
an earpiece in that thing. It's a seven-inch tab. It's basically you know a Nexus Seven style tablet from the front with an earpiece, and you know all the commercials are people holding it up to the head and using it as a phone. So there are already devices in that you know in that product range, but you know you have to. It needs to be done right because you know otherwise some things are just plain ridiculous. So to put a cap on this. Um... We are going to make sure that iMore is the absolute best place for you to get the absolute best information leading up to and following Apple's September 10, suppose September 10 um, <laughs> event, and that includes the iPhone 5S, the iPhone 5C, iOS 7, and everything else. Maybe new iPods, maybe new Macs, whatever they put out. We are going to be your filter, your 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 um, one-stop shop for all the best stuff. And to make it even easier for you to follow us, whether that's on Twitter or YouTube or Facebook or Google+, or in the comments, however you want to do it, we are holding a counting down to the iPhone event mega contest. And what that means is every week for the next four weeks up until the event, we are giving away a $500 gift certificate that you can put towards the purchase of whatever next-generation Apple phone or product uh, you like. Like. And you know, depending on what your contract situation is, that could be an entirely free phone. That could be a couple free phones, depending on your plan situation. So all you have to do to enter is make sure you stay locked to imore.com slash iPhone dash 5S dash contest. Every day there's a new way, every weekday there's a new way to enter. Monday was Twitter, Tuesday was YouTube, yesterday was Facebook. There'll be another way up a little bit later on today. Enter all of those, follow us, we will keep you informed, and we will give you amazing stuff. So please go ahead. You can wait till the show ends if you absolutely have to. But while you're listening to the show, make sure you follow us everywhere on all the things. Peter, Richard, I have another topic to bring up to you because you guys are the best possible people in the world to talk about this. Yesterday, Plants vs. Zombies 2 officially hit the U.S. App Store. It had been in Australia and New Zealand earlier. And Georgia already has an official, well, a Georgia official um, tips, hints, and cheats post up if you want to beat it faster and better. But, uh, you know, s since the original PopCap games have come out, they've now been bought by EA. And I'll throw this to you first, Peter. EA put out, EA bought... Um, Real Racing made Real Racing 3. It was free to play. A lot of people weren't happy. EA bought Pop Caps. Plants vs. Zombies 2 came out. It's free to play now. A lot of people aren't happy. I know a mutual acquaintance of ours on Twitter saw it, downloaded it, found out it was free to play, deleted it immediately, left a one star rating, and said, F you. And, and that's not an uncommon reaction. Yeah, you know, the, the, the whole free to play thing. Um, uh, definitely, uh, I don't know, leave, leave something to be desired. Uh, in fairness, though, to, uh, to, to Plants vs. Zombies 2, I, uh, I haven't dug into it, you know, as much as Georgie has because I didn't have access to it early like she did. But um, it doesn't occur to me that it is nearly as uh, invasive and uh, obstructive as it is in Real Racing 3. I think that they've done a better job of balancing it. Um, than, than perhaps they have in the past. But, uh, you know, I really, I, I wish that this wasn't a trend. I really wish that I could just pay something to somebody for software I like and, and not have them darken my doorstep anymore for more money. Yeah, and Georgia, it wasn't enough to get Georgia to stop playing. Like, she was vaguely annoyed by it, but Georgia is also a Candy Crush monster. So I give, I don't, I don't know. Georgia playing a game to me is not an indicator of, you know, the freemium model of that game, Richard. I know you're, you know, you've you've gone through real racing already. Do you have a take on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of in the uh, I'd like to pay for it and just play it camp. Um, I mean, real racing three. I honestly think that they didn't necessarily ruin the game, but there is too much of a, you know, there is too much of an emphasis on. You know, oh, buy this now, buy this now. You get you get these little pop-ups every you know every so often. This car is cheap. You know, we're we're doing a, a sale price on this, or you know, grab this while you can. And you know, for me, nine out of ten times, I didn't have enough in-game credits, so I would have had to buy, you know, with real money. And I did buy with real well, money. I'm British money. <laughs> real well, yeah, real British money. Real British money. But yeah, I mean, it. I wouldn't say it sucked me in, but I mean, I was enjoying the game. And, you know, I, I was happily, ha well, I wouldn't say happily, but, you know, I was just handing over my money. and Begrudgingly. So I, yeah, so I, I kind of see why they're doing it because, you know, I'm, I'm generally sort of, I'm not an in-app purchase kind of person. But, here, you know, here I was just, 
you know, hand, you know, buying booster packs and new cars and, you know, topping up my credits and stuff so I can get, you know, so I can upgrade things. And they've had probably three, four, five, maybe even five, six times the cost of, you know, the game outright if they were just charging for it out of, you know, out of my wallet. Um, Plants vs. Zombies 2, like Peter says, I'm, I'm, it doesn't seem as obtrusive so far. Um, you know, obviously, I'm nowhere near as far through it as uh, as George has been, but just sort of playing it today, and I haven't yet sort of seen anything that says, you know, pay now, pay now to to progress. Let me, and let me ask you guys this, and I'll start with Peter. The original Plants vs Zombies, I th- I don't remember if it was ten dollars, but it was it wasn't an insignificant price. But there is no way people would pay the ten dollars that Super Monkey Ball was, or you know, like the fifteen dollars that Final Fantasy tried to charge. And even if they would pay a few dollars, every gaming company I've spoken to, and I'm sure if you've spoken to, have said they make so much more money on free-to-play that it doesn't seem like we, we can go back on this. That Rubicon has been crossed. Yeah, indeed. You know, I, I hate to say it, but uh, I think that a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, uh, iOS game players are penny-wise pound-foolish in this respect. You know, they, they um, see the, the free download as an attraction, but they don't um, necessarily register that if they play the game over a long period of time, they're going to spend a lot of money um, on it. You know, I, I, I hold up uh, the example of a game that I've written something about for I'm More, um, a freemium game called uh, Happy Street, as an example yes. of this. You know, my wife and I have been playing Happy Street for like a year, and I've... I've I haven't spent a lot of money on it, but I know that she's dropped probably 25, 30 bucks on this game. You know, that's real money when it comes to an yeah. iOS app. You know, she waits for the flu's sales. You know, she waits for, for the opportunities to get more than what you would get at other times. But, um, you know, if I added it all up, it would probably be somewhere between 20 and $30. It's a lot of money to spend on a game that didn't cost anything to begin with. Um, I, I just wish that there were an upper limit on what developers would charge you in the end. It, you know, it, I would feel a lot more comfortable with freemium if they said, you know what, once you spend $25, $30, we're not going to charge you anymore, but there's no mechanism in the app store to manage that right now, and I'm not sure even if there were, the developers would go along with it. As if they see, a, you know, a cash cow uh, coming, like a Candy Crush or uh, ostensibly a PVZ to, a PVZ two. Yeah, I mean, like if you buy that $99 Amex card in Real Racing Three, you should have tune-ups for life. That's all I'm saying. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. definitely. And I mean, it's funny because you know Kevin Michalek, um wanted to see what the fuss was about uh, with Candy Crush, so he ended up buying a new iPad Mini just to play it, and then spent 100 bucks the first night on it because he didn't want to have to try more than three times to beat each level. And that, for him, money wasn't that important. Georgia, who's never, ever, not ever used Facebook. Uh, actually used Facebook because she wanted to pass some levels on Candy Crush. And to me, that just goes back to that old thing, Richard, where people will, whether it's because they're impatient or they want ego gratification, they will spend more money on those things than they ever would for a product up front. Definitely, definitely. And it, it's it's my real racing three uh, experience all over. You know, I'm 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 that close to I can't quite win this race, but oh, if I just spend a little bit more money and I just buy that, you know, that add-on pack, make the car go a little bit faster. Oh, but I need to, you know, I need to buy an in-app purchase. And it, it's if I if I persevered, I could probably do it. But I, you know, I don't want to persevere. We 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 seem to want everything now. Um, I mean, the 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 freemium stuff. It's isn't doesn't bug me so much as when you pay for it you know pay for an app and then get stung for for an yeah, app purchase it's you know if, if i'm getting the game for free there is you know there is some way of playing it for for absolutely nothing i mean my wife is one of you know the millions and millions of candy crush people you know playing people all around the world and you're a candy crush widower richard Sadly, I introduced her to it. I said, "Oh, this this game's supposed to be quite fun. So you know, lots of uh, lots of people seem to like it. Go for it." And uh, yeah, I, I kind of regret that now. But you know, I think she's she spent maybe like a, a pound on a you know on in-app purchases. So you know, she makes the per, you know the the habit of not paying. She's quite happy to wait, uh, you know, and 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 go through the motions to play it for free. So it's, you know, it is definitely a cash cow, but it's, 
I'm kind of less objected to it as long as we're still getting the games for free. It's when they're trying to charge us at both ends that, you know, that that's when it really gets to me. So I want to switch gears a little bit because you put up a post for us on Apple's Maps one year later, and we did something similar with Siri last year, but it's been about a year since Apple introduced iOS 6 and Apple Maps, and, you know, it was not a great launch. Uh, Tim Cook famously apologized for it. There was all sorts of news articles about it. The quality of it was called into question. And now a year later, you went into the forums and you found a lot of varying opinions and you put together what I think is a really interesting retrospective. So one year later, Richard, how are Apple Maps doing? The short version is they're a lot better than they were. Um, I mean, when, uh, like you say, when it when it launched, it was a, a difficult time for Apple. You know, they they just they just ditched Google Maps. Um, and I, I think that was part of the, you know, part of the initial kind of shock um, you know, we'd had this relatively reliable service since the dawn of the iPhone, and then Apple decides to go it alone. And you know, we, we're used to quality products, and I think you know the combination of losing that uh, losing that kind of staple, that familiarity from Google Maps, and you know, then having what is essentially a subpar product from Apple, it, it shocked a lot of people. But you know. The the important thing to remember is that none of these mapping services are perfect. Google has its pro has its faults. Apple Maps still has its faults. But Apple clearly has put a lot of work into you know into making it better. And yet, it's you know from personal experience, it'll still take me to the wrong place from time to time. But so will Google, and so will Nokia Maps. You know, it, but the um, the kind of the comical errors. You know, the the the. 3D, you know, roads that morphed into giant craters and things like that. You know, the the consensus is a lot of people are a lot happier with it now. And of course, because it's native to, you know, to the iPhone and the iPad, there are there are massive benefits over using it still. Um, and you know, with uh, with it coming out to coming out of Mavericks later on in the year, um, I think we're I think we're really going to start seeing them push on now, and it's it's going to start becoming the product that Apple always wanted it to be. So I mean, there's there's a couple of things that I that come to mind immediately. First, the companies you mentioned, uh, Google, who basically remapped everything, Nokia, who got all the uh, Navtech stuff, and TomTom, who got the Telenav. I might have those backwards, but those are the three big mapping companies now. They have decades invested in this. They have thousands of people who are on site who go and verify, you know, that locations are correct, that emergency rooms are not only, you know, Andy Nacko will famously say this, that not only is the map to the hospital right, but there's a path to the emergency room. And Apple didn't have any of that in place, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but they've been investing heavily on that. But I think where people get frustrations is, you know, for example, a good friend of mine's house is in a park, and he's reported that house in the park every week, and it hasn't been fixed. And there's a lot of people who are reporting their house in the middle of lakes or, you know, major things that are wrong, and they don't see those things getting corrected. And then they will talk about those. And... I don't know what the ratio is because there are, you know, some things on Google are wrong too. Uh, the other day it took me and Kevin to a Labatt warehouse instead of the smartphone experts warehouse and maybe that was a better choice overall, but it wasn't the right one. Peter, do you get a sense of how much Apple still has to play catch up as to how much they just have to fix the initial bad perception? Sometimes I think that they're playing a game of I reject your reality and replace it with my own. <laughs> With some of these people, you know, I think that um, you know it's kind of like the "you're holding it uh, wrong" meme that sprouted up after the iPhone 4 came out. Um, the, these kind of issues are going to dog Apple no matter what they do. It's it's best uh, to get it right the first time, um, so uh, people aren't making fun of you and you're not having to apologize after the fact. Um, in that respect, I think that the, the tarnish is already on Maps's reputation, um, and and there's nothing really that Apple can do to polish that turd too much, um, except just continue to refine it and hope that it fades with time. Um, and certainly, I agree with with everything that Richard just said. You know, I I have not had any problems with Maps whatsoever, unlike some other navigation software um, for uh, for iOS. Um, and I might have lost Peter. 
At least it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to him as soon as he re-resolves Tron style. But, you know, I, I, I can't give Apple a free skate on this either. If I'm going from my house to downtown, works brilliantly. If I'm trying to go anywhere that's off the main path, it will take me to the area that I want to go, but it might have me spinning around the blocks or take me to slightly the wrong end point. And I think that's the really hard thing to fix is that those little details that takes an army of people on the streets, and we know they're hiring massively for this. They have a whole ground team in effect, but I think it will take them a while. Uh, Peter, what's your sense of it? I know you can't break NDA on this, but they did show it off at uh, WWDC. What's your sense of the value that we'll get from having Mavericks on the Mac as well? Sorry, Maps on the Mac as well. I think it's going to be huge because Apple is really trying to cross-pollinate maps into a lot of different areas. One of the things that Apple talked about publicly was uh, the MapKit API as a way of um, getting maps into third-party apps in OS X, and uh, you're going to be able to do things like pad your um, uh, your, your, your calendar with, uh, with travel time and stuff like that. Apple is really trying to make maps information, maps data, an integral part of the user experience on both OS X and iOS. I think that that's very smart. Yeah, and you know, it, w one of the drawbacks that they had is because Google was primarily a web service, you could very easily share maps. If I had something on my phone and I wanted to say, you know, Peter or Richard, here I am, and I sent that to you, whether you had Google Maps or not, you could click on that link, it would open it up in a web browser, you could see where I was. Where with Apple Maps, they didn't have that. And now at least if you're on the Mac, um, that will be a possibility. And I wonder, Peter, because they're doing so much good stuff on the browser now. We're going to have iWork in the cloud. I wonder if we'll get maps in the cloud at some point as well. Wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me. I think it'll be a ways down the road. But, yeah, that, that it seems inevitable that that's the direction that we're headed in. So, so one of the other things I wanted to bring up, Peter, you did this excellent editorial, and I think it's, it's a little bit rage-fueled or frustration-fueled, at least, about Apple's branding problems. And I can't tell you how often on iMore we get people asking about iTouch. Why don't we have it mentioned? And we're like, and you know, maybe, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we should bow to conformity and mainstream opinion. But you called this Apple's branding problem in search of the iTouch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, and, and you know, I, I haven't noticed it that much on on iMore, but uh, it's because I'm still the new kid on the block, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, at the, at the Apple store I work at, not the Apple store, the, the Apple specialist I work at, we have people walking in off the street all the time who ask for the iTouch or the i5 um, or the iTouch 5 or uh, the Mini Mac or the Mac Air or the, the Mac Pro, not meaning the big tower thing or the little turbine that's coming out, but a MacBook Pro um, and every variation thereof. Uh, you, you know, it's, I think it's really easy for us to forget because we're, you know, very high information group um, and we're very insulated, I think, in our little tech bubble in, in, in the Apple world uh, that, that for a vast, vast amount of consumers, general consumers, this stuff is still kind of impenetrable tech nerdiness that they really don't care about because Dude, I was walking through Home Depot the other day I was terrified I finally understood how my mom felt at Best Buy right exactly I've had the exact same experience and in the exact same place as a matter of fact um, or you know going to the auto part parts store I'm always afraid to uh, you know display my lack of information because I feel very emasculated if I don't yes. know what you know these things do so um Richard, meanwhile, is looking at us, you know, horrified. You know, that... <laughs> it's a carburetor, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So anyway, um, uh, but, you, you know, it's, I think, and I, I don't necessarily think that it's a huge branding problem for Apple, but I observe it as an interesting sociological sort of issue um, that for the vast majority of these consumers, mainstream consumers who are buying Apple technology, even though Apple has this reputation for being a very warm and fuzzy company uh, that, that makes products that cater to, to its users, the technology is still really impenetrable to a lot of people. Um, and, you know, it's just it's a good exercise to remember when you're dealing with muggles, as I like to call them, you know, that, that they don't live this stuff like we do and you know the difference between an iPod touch and an iPhone or uh, a MacBook Air and a Mac MacBook Pro isn't meaningful to them all they want is the device in their hands that can do what they want whether that's balancing a checkbook 
uh, visiting the web, making a phone call, or playing music. But, you know, we do kind of have it easy, and I'm going to make Richard laugh for a second, because when when he has to cover something for CrackBerry or Android Central or maybe even Windows Phone Central, and he has to deal with 9970, 9790, and all these these number names, and then uh, Ep Sprint Epic 3G, comma, My Touch Insanity, or you know, uh, 620, 720, 820, 920. I mean, Richard, how do, I don't want to say that Apple, I don't want to make Apple off, I don't want to let Apple off the hook by saying other people do it worse, but it seems like when you have long gadgety product lines, there's a tendency towards complexity. Yeah, I mean, just look at the the Samsung Galaxy line. You know, the, on the one hand, the you know the the brand is Galaxy, but at the same time, there are all these really crappy low end Galaxy phones as well as the Galaxy S4. You know, people sort of still confused as as to you know as to as to which one is which you know the mega still... is worse than the note how does that make any sense exactly you've got the mega which is worse than the note the s4 is the one that everybody thinks is a galaxy the minis so are all the... 4.3 inches yeah the minis are bigger than the iphone 5 so it's you know it's mini when you sit next to the the big one but it's not really mini and it, it... I, th I think you're right in saying that apple doesn't necessarily do it worse than anybody else um, but it's i think it's just something that the the industry as a whole has just had to come to come to terms with i mean luckily enough over here you know we don't get the ridiculous phone names that the likes of Verizon and Sprint seem to attach to every phone that comes through their doors you know we generally you know if it's if it's the HTC one, it'll be the HTC One. There's no. But that's new because the Droid in England was the milestone, and yeah, it, it's... there was the passion, and there was the dream. I mean, it, it can get crazy. My it... favorite right now is the Samsung uh, Hennessy. Oh um, yeah, definitely. You know, I I, t I told people that I'm waiting for the Alize or maybe the Purple Drank. Was that Jill Hennessy? Because that, 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 that's not that. <laughs> yeah. Renee's waiting for Jill Hennessy. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just it it does get crazy though, and I, I mean, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, it seems like there are two approaches to it. One is, and it, it's it's a little bit like car models, right? You know, for every you know Ford Mondeo or you know uh, Focus or Taurus, you get. Uh, you know, BMW 330i. And uh, if you're techie enough, these numbers mean something to you, but um, Le otherwise... Ferrari. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, you know, it's it's just a car. Um, and the same kind of goes for uh, technology, especially something that ultimately is as transitory as a phone. Something so what that you're about not Steve necessarily going to stuck with. What about Steve Jobs' famous grid? Consumer, professional, um, you know, lower end, higher, or portable and desktop. Could we ever simplify the product lines again, Peter? Like you could just have iPad, regular and mini, iPhone, regular and mini, Mac, regular and mini, and just keep it simple? Well, I, arguably it really is, but you know, I mean, that was for a specific place and time, and you know, Jobs' whole whole point in creating that grid was uh, looking at it, looking at the mess that was the Apple product line before he got there. You know, with endless variations on Performa, and uh, you know, the the seemingly endless line of Quadras, and then you know, Power Macintosh models, and so on. Um, you know, he 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 whittled it down and and he simplified it to this easy to understand four block. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that Apple has to do the same thing today, um, but it definitely served its purpose back then. Where I do wor worry about Apple getting into a similar situation is, like we were talking about before, with three different models of iPhone and you know x different models of iPad and so on. Um, adding needless complexity to the product line is a real danger, and that's something that that uh, Tim Cook and staff need to definitely watch out for. So on that vein, uh, you and I have both for the last couple months been working on previews. I've been working on iOS 7. You've been working on Mavericks. And these are not – I mean, they do a lot uh, – uh, almost like the duck on the water. The top looks not complicated, but there's a lot going on beneath the surface. And you put up your sort of – overview your grand unification of the Ma of the <laughs> Mavericks preview what was your takeaway are you happy with where Mavericks is going so far very excited about where Mavericks is going so far and it's not because of the interface you know so much has been written and I mean Renee you have written a lot of stuff about the changes to iOS 7's interface Mavericks is not getting the same kind of makeover that iOS 7 is sure there are a couple of new cosmetic features like they ran out of felt they ran out right, of wood. 
<laughs> they ran out of fa- yeah. There's some less skew- skeuomorphism. Um, there's uh, uh, you know there's some 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 mild changes like finder tabs and stuff like that. But for the most part, anybody who's familiar with mountain lion or anything going back to snow leopard, uh, even leopard isn't really going to be jarred that much by the changes. Uh, that are coming to Mavericks interface. Where the real stuff in Mavericks is that I'm excited about is under the hood. When you're dealing with stuff like timer coalescing and AppNap and all these other under the hood technologies, the stuff that Apple puts in its preview page under the advanced technologies umbrella, that's where the real meat of this is. And that's what's so exciting about Mavericks because this is stuff that's not only going to improve the performance of Mavericks running on your current computer, but it's also going to improve the efficiency of Mavericks running on your current computer. So you're going to get more bang for your buck. You're going to be able to do more with less memory. You're going to be able to get longer battery life. Uh, even if you haven't invested in a new Mac, MacBook Air or ostensibly another new Has- Haswell machine whenever they might be announced, um, it, it's, it's really going to help out a lot. So that's definitely the stuff that I'm excited about. And you know, I, I got one of those new MacBook Airs, and I am running Mavericks on it, and not to break any non-disclosure agreements, but I opened that thing up after a week or two weeks, and it's still at 85 or 90 percent charge. And then I run it, and it goes for 10 hours. And it, it one of the things I talked about on Vector a couple weeks ago with Brian Klug is that Apple is pretty much the only company doing honest battery measures right now, because they're saying this is useful life of the machine. This is you working on the machine. It'll get 12 hours, or an iPhone will get 10 hours. And they, so far with my test, they really mean that. And it's, I think we're in for a surprise when Mavericks and those Haswell Macs hit. Absolutely, yeah. It should be really great. So I looked at the iOS 7 side of things, and I, I have to admit, I'm as change adverse as the next guy. And when I first saw it up on screen at WWDC 2013, I had a mixed reaction because... The parallax stuff was amazing. Like when you just watch that video that Tim Cook introduced with Johnny Ive narrating it, it, parts of it were magical. The multitasking, the Safari tabs, gorgeous. But then there was a lot of visual stuff, especially the new icons, a lot of the new glyphs, the weighting of the uh, typeface, that as someone with a design background, I found off-putting because they were weighted totally differently than what I was used to and what Apple had used to date. But then the more I used it, that stuff started to fade away because I realized that is just lipstick, that's makeup. And the real story of iOS 7 is the new bones, the new architecture, and that's something I'm now getting made fun of in the comments for repeating so much, but it is that physics and particle engine, it's that architecture. And when I was doing the preview, uh, and you can, by the way, you can find Peter's preview at uh, imore.com slash mavericks dash preview, and mine's at, I, at um, imore.com slash ios dash 7 dash preview, it's the, it's the way iOS 7 moves and breathes and is a physical object, a virtual one maybe, but a physical object. And more than that, that Apple gave all these tools to developers, and we're going to be able to see, I think, a whole new class of mobile software. So it'll be a little bit like 2008 when the App Store greatly increased the value of the iPhone. I think we're going to see um, applications made possible that would have been incredibly arduous to produce uh, be previously, and I did an article this week, um, you know, for Peter and and Jim in the Loop magazine about the future of human interface, and I think that Apple's iOS 7, given what they're doing with um, SpriteKit and with UI Dynamics, and what they're doing with Siri, and a lot of stuff that Google's doing with Google now, is finally what we've been waiting for that next generation of human interface after GUI and you know through multi-touch. So I'm hugely um, excited. And with that, sorry, Peter? No, no, nothing. I was just going to wrap it up by asking, I'll ask Peter next because I have an idea what he's going to say. Richard, any any apps you want to recommend this week? Anything that's taking up a lot of your time? Um, I wouldn't say taking up a lot of my time as such, but um, I've uh, just posted something today about uh, a pretty pretty nice um, travel app. Uh, it's called uh, City Mapper. Um, and it's been it, you know, nobody in the U.S. will be particularly familiar with it because it's uh, it's always been just purely based in London. Um, but you know, it looks great. It's got everything you need. You know, transit information. You know, trains, buses, those little higher you know cycle higher places. Um, and it's now expanded. They've now added New York City. Um, it's you know, it's a really really fantastic app. If you know, if you're if you you know, if you use public transport in New York City, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, I'll definitely be, you know, using it when I uh, eventually visit 
the, the Big Apple later on later on this year. But it, it's uh, it's free. You know, there's no shady in-app purchases or anything. It's it's absolutely free. Um, and I'll be really interested to hear what uh, what people in New York think of it because uh, you know on the London side, I absolutely love it. Peter, how about you? What are you going to go on this week? What did you think? I, I, I was just looking at imore.com slash games and trying to figure out that you're going to pick all of them. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I um, actually haven't had a lot of time to play games this week, but one thing I'm really excited about uh, uh, trying out is something actually that we're going to have uh, up uh, in a little bit, thanks to our friend. Uh, um, it's called Space Hulk. And uh, Space Hulk is... Uh, um, uh, available on the Mac and the PC right now, and it is based in the Warhammer universe. So if you I are a Warhammer, <laughs> yeah, if you are a Games Workshop fan, get thyself to uh, spacehulk-game.com and check it out. Blood for the Blood God. My Space Marines are armed and ready, sir. <laughs> Excellent. So I wanted to mention two things quickly. One is that Finnish version 2.0 just launched today. Finnish is the uh, goal-oriented task management app that is created by two very young developers, but they were good enough to win an Apple Design Award this year, so they make some serious product. And you're, if you have at all want to manage your time more efficiently, especially if you are goal-oriented, check it out, Finish 2.0. Uh, and the other thing, actually there's two other things. One is Disney Animated, which was my, my pick of the week last week, and I mentioned on Mac Break Weekly, it's an expensive app. It is well worth it. It is all the Disney movie-making magic at the tips of your fingers. And the last thing I want to mention, I want to give a shout-out to Federico Vitici from Mac Stories, who posted a 10,000-word review <laughs> for an app called Editorial. And if you know Tici at all, I mean, this was absolutely the app he was born to review. This is his Pieta. I have no idea how many espressos died in order for that review to live, but if you are at all interested in doing text-based work, text -based work, especially scriptable work on your iPad, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, check out his review, absolutely fantastic. Huh, Richard, where can people find out more about you and read more of your great stuff? Well, you can find me every day, of course, on uh, on imore.com, and I'm on the Twitters at Ricker666, but I'm usually more vocal on Google+, or I believe you just search for my name. Plus Richard Devine. I believe so. I've never you had to search myself. don't have vanity URLs like Phil Nickinson does. No, I'm no, I'm not that famous. We're nowhere near that Google famous. Absolutely not. Peter Cohen, where can we find you? I am also on iMore and the Loop at loopinsight.com. You can find me on uh, Twitter at flarg f l a r g h, along with app.net and just about anywhere else except for Xbox Live, because somebody ganked my um, nickname when I wasn't looking. Ah, <sighs> it's probably Major Nelson. I blame him for everything. I blame him. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um. You can find me at Rene Ritchie. You can also find me at iMore. Uh, someone was asking for me to run down the podcast that we do because they kind of lost track, and fair enough. So before we go, I'll just give you a quick rundown. I do Ad Hoc with uh, Guy English, and that's where we talk about movies. And just this week, we got Don Melton. And if you haven't heard of him, he was formerly Director of Internet Technologies at Apple. He is a big deal. He invented WebKit and Safari. Uh, he's the man. And he came on to talk about Dune with us. And it was, I couldn't even edit the show. It was so much fun. I just put it up. And yeah, it's both Dune, the movie, and the book. So check that out. I do Vector, where I interview interesting people about interesting things. And this week's episode has... Uh, Tim Stevens, former editor-in-chief of Engadget, and we talk about car-based technology, how it interfaces with mobile, and where it's going in the future, including electric cars, self-driving cars, and connected cars. I do Debug, also with Guy English, which is based on developers. We, do, we interview different developers. We had um, Gus Mueller, who does Acorn, the graphics package on last week. Spoiler alert, next week's going to be Will Shipley, who is a ton of fun and does Delicious Monster. Uh, sorry, Delicious Library for Delicious Monster. And I also do Iterate with um, Mark Edwards and Seth Clifford, and uh, we will have another episode of that up next week. Zen and Tech with Georgia, which is all about how you use technology to make a better life. And our last episodes were about why we hate people who like different phones and whether or not we should be afraid of the NSA. 
Uh, and of course, I do the I More show with the wonderful Peter Cohen and Richard Devine. And I want to thank everybody who subscribes to the show. And I want to thank everybody who joined us in the chat room today. You guys are fantastic. Peter, Richard, um, oh, I should mention, we're doing, up until the iPhone event, we are doing a daily I'm more today show to keep you updated. It's five minutes. It's ten o'clock in the morning. Richard, uh, I think that's like nine p.m. next week for you or something. <laughs> yeah, it's it's some kind. You know, sometime in the future. Yeah, they already had the iPhone event in England. He just won't tell us what happened. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's NDA. If you want the news as soon as it's available, join us every day, ten a.m. Eastern. 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific, right on imore.com, and we will start your day off right. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Cool. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>